I'm speaking with Ishmael Rodriguez, master carver and acclaimed instructor. But he's not teaching these days. He's involved in doing his art. And he's having a show. Can you tell us? Excuse me, Ishmael? Uh -huh. Can you tell us where your show is taking place? Your uh, current exhibit? Well, this, uh, the exhibit is in uh, Lennox, Mass. And uh, it's at the uh, Lennox Art Artisan Art Gallery in Lennox, Massachusetts. How uh, I and a, and a friend, uh, Gigi. How long is the exhibit going to be on? I think it's continuous. It's continuing for a length of time. There is no sort of ad deadline, but but probably uh -huh. it is from from uh, I believe it's from uh, from summer to autumn to the end of autumn, and uh, and that's about it, you know. What are you doing? What's your project right now? Well, my project right now, for one, is that I'm working on a wood piece here. And uh, it's obviously going to be this a woman figure who is sort of uh, is in the metamorphosis state, I guess, as you would call it. And, uh, and what's taking place here, she's uh, just sort of posing, but it's more than the posing itself. It has a story that goes along with it. This is a particular moment in time that we all have, or that we all live. And uh, what is uh, happening here is that the person, not only because it's a woman figure, but it also can pertain to the uh, male. And, uh, what is doing it's well I'll tell you what carving not to leave the, the, the um, moral of the story in a sense but that it's uh, it's like a carving to me is like peeling onion peel and onion peel and you get down to the core of it not only am I removing wood but I'm also removing those onion layers appealing within myself that uh, carving in my life actually saved my life and of course I have a dear friend that also helped me and uh, that we all have our trials and tribulations of life and what have you like this and uh, when I carve it seemed like I get these metaphysical revelations about myself, because that's what I'm, I'm sort of getting more involved in, is more in looking within into the inner person um, and uh, seeking my authentic self. I have a pretty good idea of who I am. I know basically I'm a very compassionate person. I have a lot of good in me, but for many years I didn't. I was going the other way. I was actually running away from myself. And with the help of friend, friends, um, I was able to learn how to embrace all those fears that had me running in the wrong direction. And uh, How did art figure into this scenario? Well, but, well, it came in. I was a late bloomer, put it, you know. I was a late bloomer. I didn't take up art until my 30s, actually. And uh, where were you living at the time? I was living at the time in uh, Sacramento, California. No, I wasn't raised there, but and I met a gentleman. The name was uh, James DeFoya in Sacramento, California, and uh, he had been through a lot, and. Uh, he took me to his house once, and I saw all these sculptures. He'd done a lot of Native American artwork and so on like this. And I didn't even know what the heck artwork was then. I was just a kid that, I grew up on the streets. And uh, How old were you when you met him? Oh, I met him when I was about, oh, I would say my 30, 29 or 30. 
And uh, I saw all these beautiful sculptures he did. He did basically Native American artwork and stuff like that. Did these large, to me, they were beautiful uh, totem poles that he would make out of uh, palm trees and what have you. And he did soapstone. And he did a lot of uh, Native American things. And, uh, and I saw there was a contentment in his eyes. The guy was a, a very much at peace. And I know at the time I wasn't at peace. I didn't even know what peace meant, you know. But I know there was a continuous battle raging within myself. The very fact is that I didn't know who I was. I was running on, uh, on a subconscious and uh, there was no one in the driver's seat. And I was just a young kid that grew up on the street. A lot of anger, I'm so, sure, from a lot of repressed uh, hurt and what have you like this. And uh, so he took me under his wing, in a sense. He took me to his house permanently. He said, why don't you come and live with me and my wife and my kids and what have you. And uh, I felt, uh, but there was something that he, that I saw sort of uh, radiating from him. And I wanted that. I said, maybe he could give me that, though I never mentioned that. So I went to his house, he had me help him around. He helped me help him move stone and so on like this. And I asked him one day, I said, hey, why don't you teach me how to carve? He said, I haven't got time, Ishmael. He said, I gotta feed my family. I gotta feed the kids, my wife, gotta pay the rent. But if you could see something, you learn, you know, and you pick up on it, great. He said, but I haven't got time, just look. So I looked and I looked. I couldn't make, make out heads from tails what the heck he was doing. But I noticed how he would hold the tools and so on like this and how he would really get into it. He was really just totally, up, you know, showing the love that he had for what he was doing. And, uh, and I started to go through trial and error. I started teaching myself. At first, I could only stand maybe an hour of it. I would have to go out and I said, I gotta go party or something, you know, have a couple of beers, it was partying to me. And uh, then after that, I got more into, the, into it more into it and I, I was affected by his carving the piece that I wasn't aware of that exists within us all if we only slow down long enough and be honest and real enough to look within ourselves and I said oh is there a God there must not be a God he wouldn't have let me go through all these changes I went through in my life my God and uh, so what I did I started doing this carving, trial and error, of course. I would look at books, try to learn from that, see how they're holding the hands, see how this curving is, this or that would go in the sculpture. And then things started to gel after about a year. Did he let you use his tools? Oh yeah, he lent me his tools and uh, he showed me how to sharpen tools how to sharpen metal tools for the stone and so on like so that. So you're working basically with soapstone? I worked in soapstone for a long time. That's sure. a good, that's a good uh, medium to start with. Yeah, it's, 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 I would suggest that someone start out in soapstone because it's soft mm -hmm. and you won't get discouraged. That's how I started. Yeah. Oh, in soapstone? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I yeah. saw some of your soapstone. Yeah, I learned from you. Uh, <laughs> you taught me the, uh, you taught me how to carve stone. It's all about passing it on. This it's, was it 1980. Was, 1980. I met you in 1980. That's right. I went through the trial and error thing, you know, and as I was, and and for once in my life, it seemed like that mind chatter that we all have got quieter and quieter, and it wasn't distracting me, and I would just be able to get in the spirit of the wood in the stone and uh you weren't working with wood at that time right? no just soapstone well no i did work on wood yes i did what did you do uh, uh, in wood in wood well i made uh, i made a ma medicine man with one of those a daniel boom sort of hats and everything and i made lizards and uh, i made buffalo heads with horns and everything like this 
So you were doing a lot of representational type work or, or very stylized type work? Uh, it was a representational, uh, sort of traditional to a certain extent, but with my own way of telling the story, Native mm -hmm. American. Right. But style-wise, it was pretty, it was pretty representational. Pretty representational, yeah. And, uh, and then I, after a while, things started to click. And, uh, and you started selling at that point. I mean, not too long after you started uh, No, after about, a, after about a year, a little over a year, uh, this, uh, this guy that I was staying with, the guy Jim, uh, told this guy, uh, um, what the heck, I forgot his name. He was a, uh, a Native American uh, uh, collector, collector mm -hmm. of um, Native American uh, art. Uh, which I didn't wasn't aware of that one day this guy drives up in El Dorado and he tells me, uh, "Hey, I heard you've been doing some work here, carving. Now uh, my name is Herb Puffer," and I didn't know who the guy was. His pants was all ripped, but he come out as pretty nice looking El Dorado car. You know, <laughs> I figured this guy got more money than I. You know? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I had never sold nothing, and he said, "I'd like to invite you to show some of your works." at my gallery and what I, I didn't know that he was one of the largest Native American art collectors in the mm -hmm. in part of in part of the world, the world I should say. And uh, then he had me have a show there. And the guy that came up there at the time was the governor of our California at the time, Jerry Brown and some of his staff. I didn't know who these guys, they were all dressed up and everything. I met them, they were very nice and everything. I like nice people. And uh, so we hit it off and so on, and he bought a couple of my sculptures for $1,200 each. It was the first time in my life I ever had so much money. Yeah, I was raised, uh, how would I say, dirt poor, you know. And uh, my family were having a rough time, but we never considered ourselves death uh, dirt poor simply because we had pride in ourselves and uh, and we really you know whatever we were happy to a certain extent you know that we had a there was up and downs in our lives you know my father had taken off my mother had a raising family of 13 well anyway um, so I got into art and uh, I've been doing art I think now I'd lost track about maybe about 35 years. I was, uh, I had received a, uh, how would I say, a grant from the California Art Council. And uh, How did that happen? Well, one day I had heard from some people that they're giving out grants. And uh, I didn't know how to do a grant or anything like that. But uh, so the, I called the guy, up there in the art council, the people suppose the office that issues the uh, forms to, to fill out for art grants and to see if you would, uh, you know, would, you would be uh, qualified to receive it. So anyway, I told him, hey, I've been working my ass off for, for years now. And I said, and I hear you're giving out money. How many years were you working at that point in art? Oh, at that time, I believe I was working maybe about, oh, or maybe about, I forgot, three, four, five years or something. I'm not sure, you know. And uh, then after a while, so he sent me a form. I filled out the form. He told me, what am I going to do? And I said, I'm going to teach the blind. I don't know, whatever. Something just gushed out of me, you know. I teach the blind. And uh, so he said, oh, okay. He said, We'll send you a form. Send me a form. And in the form, they wanted you to tell them, explain how you were going to set it up, how you were going to teach it, and so on like this. I had no idea of how to teach the blind, and there were no books on them, though I tried to mm -hmm. do research on it. There was nothing, no techniques, actually. And uh, so what I did is that uh, somehow... I like to say that my my spirit guide of God, if you wish to call it that, revealed to me how to go about it. What had happened is that my mother, who I used to keep in touch with, 
had um, had lost sight, her sight, visual sight, and I, I was always in touch with her. And then she uh, passed away, of course, and uh, not from a heart condition or something. But she had also lost her sight, and something told me, you know what? Just in dedication to her, I want to, you know, teach the visually impaired. You know, and uh, so anyway, I just got this insight somehow. I believe it's very uh, mystical, spiritual, and so on like this. I, ha I had this ability, but I never knew I had it. And so what I did, I got with the uh, visually impaired, and I fixed tools in her hand a certain way or had them hold the tool in a certain way that they would be able to relate with that the tool in her hand and be able to touch the stone with her fingertips where in essence the fingertips became their eyes it's what they touched with and they felt and I would make these uh, these uh, how would you say it these marks on the uh, thing on the stone so they could know where they would carve how to stay within a certain area of the stone and so on like this. And then I showed them, and they would hold the chisel rather than from the handle, from the metal. And I showed them how to hit, hit it with a mallet and so on. Then after a while, a few of the students caught on very well. And I did this for years. Matter of fact, you were the one that drove me to these workshops when I was teaching the blind. And uh, that's Gigi I'm referring to. <laughs> that was 1982. I was uh, assistant to Ishmael Rodriguez at the International Sculpture Conference, which yeah. took place in Oakland, California. Yeah. I was invited to teach the, uh, as a, they had heard that there was this guy out there teaching the blind. And my name was starting to catch on with people and so on like that. So they, honored my blind friends and myself by inviting us to be involved in the International Sculpture Conference. And the Sculpture Conference was like the uh, World Series in baseball, but this was in the art world. And anyone who was anyone was there. And I was to teach a workshop there. And uh, so I had my students come down and uh, my students did stone carving there. And the first time that the people actually saw these blind students carving stone. And, uh, and the thing was that, is that uh, because what well, used to be reserved uh, uh, supposedly for the visually uh, capable, the people, you know, uh, the sighted, uh, was now beginning to open for the visually impaired. And they were involved in this new workshops that were opening in various different colleges. I had different professors and what have you from all over the world, basically. I was a resource person in Washington, D.C. And they would get in touch with me and I would tell them the various techniques that I would use. And they would implement this into certain uh, workshops of sculpture that basically what used to be just for the sighted, but now it was for the visually impaired. And not, they wasn't the visually impaired, they were the visually capable now. So that whole stereotype and the words changed. And- uh, Could you tell us uh, about the, uh, the Alameda County Fair in regards to your students? And oh, you yeah. know, what took place? And then eventually yeah. when they became acquainted with how to hold the tool. They were creating beautiful sculptures out of soapstone. Uh, I entered them into the uh, Alameda County Fair, which was open to the side as well. These were amateur sculpture, sculptors. And uh, so we entered my students' works in there. Nobody knew that this is the blind and this is the side and nothing like that and their works were just entered. And my students, especially one of my students, won first place 
and the history of the Alameda County Fair that a visually impaired person competed and came out and won first place, not only one year, for three years in a row, and other students of mine, visually impaired, won second place. My spirit quest start leading me into that direction. I'm a real, well, I would say I'm a people person. I used to pick kids up off the streets rather than hanging out on the streets and doing what happens in the street and so on like that. I didn't expect them to all become sculptors, of course not. And, uh, but it gave them a choice, a time to think, a time to, to reflect, a time to get in touch. The good, the good part, which is inside, and I know in life, life moves so much and the value system is pretty screwed up, you know. And uh, people think, well, I just want to get money, a big house, and all this, which is good. But uh, the value system is messed up, figuring, well, if I have this, then I don't have to work on myself as a human being. And uh, those things such as uh, people wanting to um, achieve success and neglect that which is crying out to be free within. This was the repressed self is set free. The anger because becomes serenity and you get in touch with your higher self inside. That is very important. How did your art help you to do that? Huh? I slowed down, I stopped running, running around here and there. It gave me time to concentrate. And it just took me to a different level. I, as I was peeling away the wood, I thought, I was actually peeling away the layers that, um, that had built around me all these years. And, uh, and I didn't know it though, that's the magic of art, that that's what you're seeking. I was seeking my authentic self all the time. I didn't know it, I had too many fears, I had too many hurts, too many disappointments that I created, of course. But I was simply trying to, huh, simply trying to find that little child that's within us all. And uh, that was amazing. I didn't know that. I didn't know about the magic of art. There is a magic. And of course, you have to be seeking it with all your heart and soul. And, uh, and as I peeled and I uncovered, I found myself Art helped me find my authentic self. I got a lot of work to do, of course. With all these fears and all these other things changed? No, they won't change. Not out here in the world. It can only happen change from within. You know, the inner peace, the inner world, that's, that's where it's really at, you know. And, uh, so I see, I, I'm sorry, go on. No, no, please. I see that wood at this point is the material you're working with. It's your yes, vehicle it to, to get to these very interesting experiences. Can you tell us uh, some of your, your thoughts about the material? About, about well, wood? I, I've carved a lot of wood, different types of wood. And so like this, I've carved, oh, I've carved real hard wood. This is, Bass wood, it's a very soft wood. But to me, it isn't necessarily the softness of the wood, but it's the idea. It's what you try to bring out of the wood. It's the idea, the vision, and so on like this. And, uh, I mean, and technically, how would you compare that to stone? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's like cutting butter, cutting butter. 
That's it's a rose stone. stone. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's very soft, easy to work. Yeah, it's basswood. It's a relatively uh, soft wood, and so on. And uh, very high quality basswood. Oh uh, yeah, it's very prima. Yeah, it's always working the best. That's what I believe. You know, this way when you put all that energy and soul into it, it you project it reflects. But you have to have good material. Work with an open heart and with your soul. And it's worth the experience, let me tell you. It's very satisfying. And there are different tools used, right? Correct? Yes, it is. Matter of fact. I mean, compared to... Um, uh, to stone. To stone. Oh, I mean, yeah. you don't use the same tools, right? No, the, the, these right here are for, uh, it's for wood, of course. Very sharp. But there's a particular serenity and peace and nourishment. See, art is a nutrient. And it does do that to you. And uh, oh, it's not a lifestyle, it's a life. And, uh, and this is what I do. This is what I do, me and my friend Gigi. And, uh, and this is a bronze sculpture I'm out to clean up. Right. And I always have these particular um, right. things to it. Like this is called oneness. And that's when both hearts become together, become one. The now union, this is, excuse me, go ahead. The union of the heart and the soul. And, uh, okay, now this is cast bronze. This is bronze. Matter of fact, cast I had, bronze. Yeah, this is bronze. This is wood. And um, I and my friend Gigi in California, some years ago, went to a um, I forgot the Marin. Uh, College of Marin. College in of Marin. Kentville. Yeah, in Kentville. And we took up this class of bronze making. And, uh, and these are one of them right here. Right. And, uh, and, uh, we just paid for the bronze, and the class was very inexpensive. Very, like very $30 inex for the class. Yeah, at that time, probably it costed more now. But uh, who knows? And, you know. uh, yeah. Right, we did yeah. all the work on the metal. We did all the finishing. All the work. I'm still working on it, cleaning that out. Right, except for the casting, we did all the work. Yeah, on and uh, incredible. That was amazing. Yeah, it was, and we've done a lot of things. And done, uh, uh, Juju helped me, as you mentioned, at the International Sculpture uh, Conference. Right, and I'm, I'm the interviewer. <laughs> the, uh, and the Gigi interviewer. is the interviewer yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, she's the interviewer right now. And Gigi is, as you've seen, a very accomplished artist. Astounding. Her work is just, you know. And, you. Uh, and I'm sure the public, you out there, well, when you hear the name Gigi, uh, you come to one of our shows or Ishmael and Gigi. There's so much I could talk to, uh, talk to you about. It just, it's not ending, let me tell you. Boy, oh boy, when you open your heart up to the spirit, you know, the spirit said, go. You don't say where, you just go. And that's how we've been. I and my friend Gigi have worked together off and on for like, oh God. We've known each other for 20 years. More than that. More than 20 years. A very dear, dear friend of mine, you know. And uh, incredible. Incredible. Well, I'll tell you, you find a good friend. They're hard to find these days. They don't make them like that no more. She's all hard, good, honest, creative, talented. And, uh, but she'll tell her own story. I love the country. Coming to Woodstock, it's gorgeous. I've never seen any beauty like this on the wilderness. Wilderness, mountains, the streams, the animals, the asphalt jungle. Oh, I almost got swallowed up. But I guess it wasn't meant to be, you know. And like I say, yeah, it's beautiful. I found God. 
within myself, of course. My higher self. Of my authentic self. I'm not angry or fighting out there. Not self not trying to self-destruct. Oh, I did for a while, thank God for my friend Gigi. And other people that played yeah. a part. Yeah. It's been incredible. What a journey. This is my life. This is what I do. That's what Gigi does. That's a healer. If you honestly seek it. You know, I don't mean you come and do art and expect to have that piece and then go out and, and overly indulge in what people do and expect uh, you can't have heaven and earth at the same time. And you can't advance to a higher level if you insist on hanging on to a lower level. And, you're not, and you don't become more spiritual than you're human because you're still human. But you tackle life with more, you know, with more power, more direct, you know, and uh, yeah, and you have serenity, peace. That's what the world's looking for, of course. You know, I'm not a therapist or psychologist. I'm just a human being that experienced my spirit quest, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah. And we're not time millionaires. Can't wait around, I'll do it next week. Well, I'll do that next week. Hey, you need nourishment now. Well, I do. And, uh, and this has been my spirit quest for these, uh, huh, 35 or more years. Life waits for no one. You know, when you're young, of course, you know, which we all have been at one time, you think, well, I'm killing the time or passing the time, but you're not really passing the time. Time is passing you. You know, I still got the spirit. My friend uh, Gigi got the spirit. My spirit never died. It grew. Incredible. She's been through the evolution, the metamorphosis the soul, spiritually, physically, and mentally. So have I, you know. I've got a lot to learn, of course. The next moment isn't even guaranteed. I thank the gods, I thank the birds, I thank the crows for the very fact that I'm here to even talk about it. Oh, let me tell you. No one ever said life was going to be easy, right? You know that. And, uh, but you know what? We're here for a purpose. I know my purpose here is to put a couple of drops in the bucket for mankind. It always has been. Now I'm, what I'm trying to do is throw crumbs out there for those who were sort of neglected, who didn't have no one to put them under their wing, and that got kind of fell through the cracks, you know, and. Uh, it isn't how much you got or who you know, but it's who you are as a person. You're supposed to nourish humanity, make it a better, better world for the next generation and what have you. Something to learn, that there's a choice, there's a, you know. For me, this was my gift. Use it or lose it, they say. I've used it. I think you're someone who really can appreciate and acknowledge, you know, people's abilities and skills and talents. And I just wish there were more people like you. Yeah. So do I. I mean, you give people another chance when sure. they, they, they need that desperately. Yeah, there go I, but by the grace of. And it's also been me in so many different ways. You know, if it wasn't nice people, huh, more than nice, special people like you. I would have been pushing up daisies already, you know. And uh, a lot of nice people I met in my life. You've known a lot of people, uh, all kinds of people. Yes. I mean, your career is really taking you to uh, all yeah. kinds of, of yeah. you know, new, you know, experiences new, and everything. And new horizons. New horizons. And, sure. Yeah. I've known yeah, famous people, really, name-wise. Uh, you know, 
movie stars and so on like this. And uh, very talented people I've met. And I've even met people that fell through the cracks, you know? My God. Half the people I grew up with are already dead. But we're all on a mission. Some know it and some don't. It's just a matter of, uh, of just cultivating, look for it. And once you find it, use it. It's not a, yeah, and that's what it's for. To help you live life and enjoy life more abundantly, you know? And uh, that's what it's about. I can't wait to see what the, the next moment's about, you know? I'm very thankful, I'm thankful for being here. Thankful to realizing that uh, life is what you make it. You know, life is what you make it. And uh, to stay yeah. focused, yeah. do and use your gift. Really crucial to yeah to to be on a spiritual path. But you don't have to even call it spiritual. It's just being on a path, positive path. You know, because it was the same one that I heard as a child. And there was this uh, Hindu guy, the name was Ramakrishna. Me, I was brought up as a Catholic. I was a Nam Yo Harengi Kyo. And I had to, uh, I was searching, searching. And the thing that touched me, I read this maybe when I was 11 years old. And he said, religions are but various paths to the same truth. But of course, man always wants to say, I got the truth, I, you know, that's, that's another story in itself. There's a little thing that, uh, sort of a tongue-in-cheek thing. And they say that, uh, and I don't make, I, I don't ridicule anybody. Everybody does have to find their path. But it said that religion is for those who are scared of going to hell. And spirituality is for those who have been to hell and back. And, uh, and as that saying also goes, that we're not a, uh, we're not a spiritual or a human being having a spiritual experience. We're a spiritual being having a human experience. Yeah. And it all fits together pieces of the puzzle. Very true. Is there anything else you want to talk about? You want to, you know, give the information again about your current exhibit? Oh, uh, yes. It's in uh, Lenox, Mass. It'd be nice for you to come on down, check it out, bring an armor car with you, and uh, <laughs> just joke it, of course. But, you know, hey, it's all for sale. And uh, Reasonable price. Yeah, reasonable, very reasonable prices. Thank you very much for spending time with us. Ah, been up, yes. It's we really been you. an honor. It's been been a pleasure. Yes. And um, I look forward to speaking with you again sometime soon. Oh, sure. I got a lot more to talk about. So do you. Well, I'll welcome. interview you next time, uh, Gigi. And I think you're a real asset to Woodstock. You're a real treasure. Hmm. And um, and I'm really very pleased that you know you were willing to be interviewed today, and um, I wish you well. Thank you. Peace. <laughs>